Hello, everybody. Welcome along uh, to our great debate. Um, you made it. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> this is the great debate. So, um, welcome. Uh, my name is Grace Weeby. I am in my fourth year um, here at Adelaide Uni studying a double degree of Arts and Economics. Uh, and I'm also the student president of Evangelical Students here at Adelaide Uni, um, which is a Christian group on campus um, and the club which is putting on this event uh, today and the other events which we'll be running um, across this week. So uh, just a note, because of COVID, um, we're not only holding this live, we're also taking a recording of it, um, which will then be posted online. Um, so uh, if you would like to watch it again, um, if you've missed something or, you know, it was so good, you want to watch it again, um, it will be posted online so you can do that. Um, so a massive thank you for coming along today. Um, we hope that it will be really interesting and thought provoking time. Um, so the topic for today's discussion is how much do I owe my neighbour? So this isn't a traditional high school style debate uh, with an adjudicator and a winner or a loser, um, but rather it's a presentation of ideas uh, aiming to stimulate and provoke your own thinking and worldview. So I hope this will be a really beneficial time for everyone here. Um, and there will also be an opportunity for uh, members of the audience to ask questions of our speakers um, in a moderated Q&A time at the end. Uh, so I know everyone's busy. Um, we'll aim to finish up just before uh, 2 o'clock to allow everyone to uh, make it to their next commitments on time. Uh, so today we have two speakers, as you can see. Uh, so firstly, we have David Hunter, um, who is a senior lecturer in ethics and professionalism at AHMS. Um, and then our second speaker uh, will be Reverend Jeff Lynn, uh, and he is the Anglican chaplain here at the Uni of Adelaide. So please welcome me in joining our speakers. So uh, the format of today will be as follows. Uh, both speakers will present one five-minute address on the topic of how much do I owe my neighbour. Uh, I will ring a bell once at five minutes and then continuously at six. Once both speakers have presented, uh, we will have a moderated Q&A time. So I'll, I, I will outline the guidelines for the Q&A time after both of the speakers have presented. So without further ado, I would like to invite David to come forward. Please make him feel welcome. So I'm always a little worried when I'm asked to do events like this because while I'm a philosopher and thus a lover by knowledge, of knowledge and wisdom, I'm not that sure I'm all that wise. Uh, and I suspect if I am wise, it, it's only my lack of awareness of my own wisdom. So hopefully I, I get to learn something today. That's my main aim. So as a philosopher, one of our deeply annoying traits is that we always look for the prior question that needs to be answered before a question can be answered. And here I think it is, who is my neighbor? Right? I think that's the kind of prior question before we can answer uh, this question. And now, I take it that what we mean by neighbor is not Greg and Jessica Gilding, who live next door to us, because I know what I owe them. That's uh, we owe them dinner, because uh, they had us over a couple of weeks ago, and we need to invite them over. So that's, that's trivially true, but not particularly interesting. Apologies. I'm shorter. Um, <laughs> um, so I think, I think what we mean is something more broader, uh, things that we can have moral duties towards, or obligations towards. And, and I think the answer to that is, well, at least the entirety of the human race. Uh, and why is that? Well, uh, surely it's mor morally arbitrary where someone is. It, it might change the effectiveness of my response to them. I mean, there's a big difference if somebody needs help and they're a million miles away from me, I can do very little for them. But it doesn't reduce that there's some obligation uh, towards them. Uh, so in other words, if I've got moral obligations to Jeff here uh, to recognize the fundamental equality of his moral status to my own, then likewise I have them to all of you and to the uh, untold billions of, of humans uh, who exist. It might be that I've got stronger obligations towards some, such as my children, but I still uh, think I have obligations to everyone else as well. I suspect it goes beyond that, uh, since I take that our, our neighbours are just those who we have moral duties towards, and I suspect that also includes members of other species, even if our moral duties towards them might be a bit weaker. Um, and I think, I'm going to hazard a guess, that a lot of you agree with me even though you don't think you do. Uh, and so here's a simple test to tell if you agree with me. If you think there'd be something morally obnoxious about somebody kicking a dog, then you also share the view that there are some moral obligations uh, towards other species, even if they might not be the same obligations we have to fellow humans. But 
for the sake of this, let's constrain this to our fellow humans, both here in Australia and, and elsewhere. What do I owe them? I think it's fair to say we live in a world with big challenges, uh, overwhelming moral issues, problems, and, and cares. So we have, of course, in the forefront of our mind now, COVID-19, and then hurtling down the tracks behind it, climate change, uh, one, the disaster and tragedy present, the other, the disaster that's already happening, and it has been happening for a while, but, but which its full implications are yet to play out. And then there are also other, much more long-standing moral tragedies and injustices lurking in the background. So there's poverty and inequality. Uh, so in Australia, someone in the richest 20% lives in a household that has, on average, the annual, an annual income six times uh, those of the, in the poorest 20%. Look more globally, and you'll find that the richest 1% in the world have more than twice as much wealth as uh, 6.9 billion people. Switch to world hunger. Uh, every 10 seconds, a child uh, dies of hunger and malnutrition. Switch to colonialism. Uh, our structures and practices, both past and present, guarantee the ongoing exploitation and, and degradation of former colonial countries and the peoples whose lands those were originally were. Uh, then we have racism, sexism, discrimination. We live in a world that's fundamentally deeply unjust and somewhat broken. Uh, we live in a world where we spend more uh, money as a nation on hair care than poverty. Uh, more on alcohol than international aid, where 90% of our research funding is spent on problems that uh, only affect the richest 10% of our species. Truly serious problems, such as male patent baldness, uh, baldness or erectile dysfunction, uh, receive uh, vastly more funding than, say, malaria or tuberculosis. And those just injustices, issues, cares can feel deeply overwhelming. What can I, as an individual, do in the face of them? I think it's easy to give up and think, nothing, I should just take care of myself. In this broken world, at least I can look out for me and mine. But I think that's a mistake. I think, yes, looking at the whole of the train work that uh, our species has somewhat achieved can be pretty overwhelming, but together, reasonably small and caring steps can make the world a better place, in small and minor ways, perhaps, for those who live in it. When people talk about time traveling to the past, they worry, well, at least when philosophers talk about time traveling to the past, I guess I don't know if everybody sits around doing these kinds of things. Um, they, they worry about like uh, radically changing the present by doing something small. Uh, so like stepping on a butterfly in that, that Ray Bradbury uh, short story. But we tend not to see the implication of that, which is that if we could radically change the present by doing something small in the past, then we can radically change the future by doing something small in the present. So lead from that, what are some small things I think we can do, uh, and therefore I think perhaps we owe to each other and to our neighbours in the future? Care. Uh, yeah, excellent. I'm coming to the wrap up anyway. Yes, timed it right. Uh, of course, I just wasted my time. Oh no. Uh, it's sticking out. Um, okay, care. Uh, so don't get caught up in distraction, right? Focus on what's happening to both yourself but also to other people. Believe carefully, uh, so the second point, by which I mean do your own research, but not what that means now in common parlance, aka watching a YouTube video for five minutes and then forming a strongly held belief. Um, it means trying to ensure that your beliefs are as well evidenced as possible and be careful to be aware of your own biases, but also have humility about your beliefs. You, you could be wrong. Three, uh, understanding, tolerance, and respect. Try and be big-minded rather than small, accepting and caring rather than condemning. Um, and I think we're going to see this more and more as, as kind of COVID closes in, so to speak, and we're seeing this in regards to, say, uh, people who are anti-vaccination, ah! uh, where people are being very closed-minded rather than uh, understanding. Uh, finally, uh, hope, I think, is probably the, the, most, the biggest thing of all. If we can maintain our own hope, uh, then we can hope to help others. Thanks. Thank you, David. Well, um, beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, now we're going to hand over to uh, Jeff, and he's going to give his... Terrific. Uh, well, it is great to see so many here today, um, even with the inconvenience of masks, um, all to explore some important ethical questions. Um, it's a wonderful privilege as well to be able to address you, offer a few reflections alongside David, uh, whose thoughtfulness and insight I'm sure is evident to all. How much do I owe my neighbour? 
Um, as I said, there's three possible ways to answer this question. You could say, I owe them nothing, I owe them something, or I owe them everything. Nothing, something, or everything. Uh, as a Christian chaplain, I'd like to consider what Jesus Christ has to say on the subject uh, through two parables or stories that he tells. One's very famous, the other will be much less well known. How much do I owe my neighbour? Well, the first answer would be nothing. Uh, this is the view that in the end you have to take care of yourself and your loved ones uh, because if you don't, then no one else will. Uh, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. For all the talk of collaboration and community, at the end of the day, you just have to look out for number one. It feels kind of selfish, but it works for me. Well, clearly, COVID has exposed some of the shortcomings of such extreme individualism. It's become apparent we simply cannot survive on our own because what others do profoundly affects all of us. That's the reason, in the end, I think, why we choose to follow the rules imposed by the government. Because just as others owe us something, so we in turn owe them more than nothing. And yet this approach is good in theory, but hard in practice. How much is something? Uh, what's the minimum, really, that I can get away with? And when the primary appeal to follow the rules is usually to keep you and your family safe, well, that's really just self-interest. It's inevitable in that context that we find ourselves worrying, well, what if others don't comply when I do? Will my sacrifice make a difference in the end? It's in that context that Jesus, I think, offers the most radical answer of all. He ups the ante and says, actually, we owe others everything. He describes a selfless self-sacrifice, which is the reason why, at a purely superficial level, I continue to check in with QR codes, even though I'm old enough to have been fully vaccinated and I'm still nervous about being retrospectively locked up. But more profoundly, Jesus tells his most famous parable, that of a good Samaritan, a foreigner who's willing to do what no countryman will do. He'll go out of his own way, he'll rescue an injured traveller, and he'll pay for that complete stranger's medical costs entirely out of his own pocket. Now, before you write Jesus off as a somewhat idealistic dreamer uh, with no grasp on the real world, let me point out that at least at one level, he's somewhat honest about life on planet Earth. You see, we live in what's called a zero-sum game. My pleasure is always the product or cause of another's pain, which means that if I'm to get ahead, someone else gets left behind. Did you know that Jesus' words in this parable are enshrined in some of our legal systems, in the so-called Good Samaritan laws? You can be convicted of failing to help a stranger in need. So think, for example, of the Victorian driver last year who stopped to film the car crash that killed four police officers but didn't bother trying to help them. Nevertheless, the biggest problem with Jesus saying you owe your neighbour everything is that it doesn't explain why. Why would I do so, especially if it's costly? Because I'll get in trouble if I don't? Because of self-interest? Because it's self-satisfying? Because it's just right? Well, here's the motivation that Jesus offers. He says the reason we owe our neighbour everything is because God has given us everything first. In the less well-known parable that he tells, Jesus describes a master who forgives a million-dollar debt owed him by one of his servants, only for that servant to promptly go out and sue a fellow servant who owes him a few pennies in comparison. Unsurprisingly, the unmerciful servant is rightly held to account by the master for failing to treat others with the mercy he himself so unexpectedly received. Now, for the record, in saying we owe others everything, Jesus is not advocating some kind of political collectivism. He's not saying we ought to live in a society where all resources are pooled and shared and individual possessions are abolished. Jesus expects that there will always be wealthy and poor. There will be haves and have-nots. What Jesus is saying is that the only sustainable motivation to compel us to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves, even when it costs us dearly, 
is to first acknowledge the way that God has treated us in our hour of need. Uh, That's the reason why, in case you've ever wondered, the defining symbol of Christianity is a cross. It's of a place where Jesus will actually lay down his life for others. And it's the defining symbol of Christianity because it's meant to remind us that we ought to seek to live the way Jesus did and to do what Jesus did. Now, I realise that in me saying all that, that'll raise a whole bunch of questions, so I'll look forward to Q&A. Thanks very much. Beautiful. Thank you, Jeff. All right, so now we will have our open uh, Q&A session. Um, so this is, for you, this is a chance for you to ask questions, um, both to David and to Jeff, um, regarding the topic on which they have just spoken. Um, So please keep all questions on topic. Um, As moderator, I hold the right to refuse questions that I deem to be inappropriate, um, and please make sure that all questions are actually questions. Um, This isn't a chance for everyone to stand on their soapbox. So questions only. Um, Also, please be respectful to both speakers and other members in the audience. So uh, questions need to be kept to 30 seconds in length, um, and the speaker, so um, David and Jeff, um, they will have two minutes to answer. Um, and I will ring the bell at one minute and 30 seconds uh, and then again at two minutes um, to let you know to wrap up your answer. Uh, so when you ask your question, um, if you have a question, um, I'll ask you to line up on this side of the room. There's a microphone just set up there um, so to make sure that everyone can hear your question. Um, so yeah, we'll just form a line. Um, when it's your turn, um, you ask your question. Um, when you ask your question, please um, outline who you're asking the question of, either David, Jeff, or both of them. Um, and then once you've asked your question, you can make your way back to your seat. And then once that um, once that question has been answered, um, it will open back back up again, uh, and the next person can ask their question, uh, following the same process as before. All right, so that is the Q&A. So, um, yeah, feel free to make your way over to the microphone if you have a question, and we will begin. First question, lucky me. Uh, David, it was good to hear you speak. Nice to meet you for the first time. Um, you made a point of being informed and considering every situation, uh, but you also talked about the butterfly effect and how very small decisions can have a big impact. How do you think about, how do you give so much thought and research into every single decision you make? So a nice, easy, small question. Excellent. Um, (laughs) uh, So, yeah, look, you're you're right. There's a kind of fundamental tension here where I think it's really important to be very well informed about what we're deciding, uh, particularly where it has implications for impacts on others and so on, uh, but also that we're really, we're very limited, right? We don't have that much time. We don't uh, have that much access to resources. It's difficult. I mean, I always say to my students when they're writing essays about something, I say, look, when, you, when you're deciding on what you're answering, pick the smallest question you possibly can, because that way you've got a chance of actually answering that. Don't say, I'm going to solve this giant issue uh, in the space of this 1,500-word essay, because look, there's 2,000 papers on that, and they haven't solved this giant issue, right? Don't think you're going to necessarily be able to do it in that space. I mean, if you do, great, fantastic, I'm very happy, but you probably won't. Um, so what I think you have to do then is have practice a certain amount of epistemic humility. Uh, we have to outsource. We have to turn to experts and expertise to some degree. Right? We have to then be cautious about who our experts are and so on, so it moves it back another level. Um, but I think that's the, that's the solution, is to say, I don't know who does know. For now, I'll trust them. Um, but then again, I think we do that all the time. I mean, how many of us here drove here or, or travelled here in a, in a motor vehicle? Right, probably most of us. How many of us understand how a combustion engine works? I have no idea. Right? But I trust that other people do because I'm getting on top of something which is basically an explosive device uh, and driving with it into town. So, mm. Thank you. Um, my question is for David. Again, sorry. To what extent do I have an obligation to act to care for my neighbour even if it costs me? 
Yeah, okay, that, that's a tough question. And to some degree, I want to hear from Jeff on this as well. <laughs> so I'd like to bring him in as an answer. Um, so look, the really easy cases. So if you look at the kind of progress in moral philosophy on this question, people start from these really easy rescue cases. So Peter Singer has this famous example about a drowning child in a pond. Where he says you'd be morally callous if you walked past a child, drowning child and didn't save them. And from that, he derives a principle of, of moral, uh, comparable moral significance, where he says you ought to save your neighbor or do things that benefit your neighbor as long as it doesn't cost you more than the benefit to them. So that's one way you could answer this question. Other people think that's too demanding. Uh, and I, I worry about it being too demanding, given as I've described the state of the world. Uh, it really is taking us down a very long way. So I think there is a really tough question about, is there a sphere that I can cut out that I say, this is mine, and I don't have to give from it? Or is it the case that, um, as might be the case, uh, as Jeff uh, sort of suggested, is it the case that everything comes from God, possibility, or uh, as uh, John Locke writes in the 16th century, uh, he says in terms of taking property from nature, uh, that uh, the only way that can work is by mutual consent, and the only way we can deem that everybody would consent is if we leave enough and as good. Um, and I think when Locke's writing, it makes sense to think somebody could go out and say, well, that's my tree, because right? the other people don't claim they own that tree. I think now that's a really hard position to sustain. Uh, and so my take on kind of Locke uh, is account of, of property rights, and by the way, that account of property rights basically underwrites our account of property rights. Um, my take on it is that leaving enough and as good is actually much more radical than Locke thinks it is. It probably means we have to, our attitude to property should be, it's not ours, we're borrowing it for now, but if somebody has a greater need, it's probably theirs. So. Yeah. Um, thanks, David. Yeah, look, um, I... I guess the thing that I've, and I talked about this a little bit, um, in recognising that it's one thing to say you owe others something, but then the question is how much is it going to cost me? And that's the right question to ask. I guess what I've tried to do, and maybe I haven't done it hard enough um, and been provocative enough, is to say that the way in which Jesus tries to answer the question is to actually make your decision making very simple. Uh, you don't have to try and do the cost-benefit analysis on what it's going to cost me to benefit someone else. He just says you need to be willing to give up everything. Now, I'm not saying that's easy in practice, but in terms of thinking about the framework, that's at least clear. The question, I think, becomes then, why would you ever buy into that or why would you subscribe to that? So, you know, we, um, if you think back in time, uh, just over 100 years ago when Britain declared war on another country, a whole bunch of Australians said, we'll go and fight because we think that that's the right thing to do and we will, uh, even if there's no apparent benefit to us, uh, there might be in, in the long term, we will still sign up and enlist. Um, that's, I'm not certain that that would necessarily be the same today in our country, and I'm not being particularly critical. I think we've just reframed the way in which we try and answer the question. Uh, what Jesus is trying to do is say that a willingness to be sacrificial, even at great personal cost, is the ethic that he's proposing. And really what you need to work out is, do you think there's any credibility in that I've tried to say that at least part of the answer comes in the fact that he leads by example and is willing to do so himself. But that's the kind of question I think that, it's, that it caused us to at least reflect on um, about how we want to live today. So, thanks. Yeah, um, question for David. Um, where would you say the principle of moral responsibility comes from? Like Peter Singer, why is it morally right and morally wrong to either save or not save the child in the pond? Like if where does the the reason that it's right, or f more fundamentally, where does the right come from? Okay, so so I'm taking that as a kind of question about moral status more than anything else. So why why do we have an obligation to save the child? And the answer is because the child matters morally. Why does the child matter morally? Um, I mean, fundamentally, I think it comes down to the recognition that they are like you, right? They are similar, and if you think you matter morally, then they matter morally too. The other side of the coin, uh, I think, has to do with responsibility. And, and I mean, I'll quote that great philosopher Spider-Man, right? With great power comes great responsibility. And in the case of the child in the pond, at the point when you're the bypasser walking by, you're the person with the great power, right? So that's why it becomes your responsibility. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this is for both of you or for whoever's interested. Um, David, you mentioned like um, you were talking about property, property laws and correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of like looking after now to give to those who need it later. Was that kind of your understanding? I don't sure. Disagree. Um, anyway, and Jeff, you were talking about um, people in the world have, like there are those with haves and with have nots. Do you think that those who owe, that those who have owe more to others than those who have less? I mean, I guess it, it, it flows from just what I just said, right, in terms of great power, great responsibility. Yes, if you have more ability to help, then you have more obligation uh, to do so, I think. And so, yeah, it makes logical sense that uh, those who have more have more of an obligation. So I'd say it flows. Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. It, it's a hard question to answer in some ways because it's still... The reason I find it hard is because you still have to ask the question, um, how do you decide what constitutes more? Um, now, at one level, that's perfectly obvious, right? If you have lots of money, then you might say you have an obligation to use your money in a particular way compared to someone who has less. Um, but the person who has lots of money might not have much time so there's a, there's a variety of resources that we have at our disposal. Um, I think probably my reflection would be that um, instinctively all of us think that uh, being given much gives you uh, a sense of obligation or responsibility, whatever word you want to use, to use that well. Really the question becomes is um, in what sense and for what purpose? And... Uh, again, as I've tried to talk about today, I think what Jesus is saying is, at least in the worldview that he's describing, to be given much by God uh, in turn uh, requires us to adopt a similar kind of attitude towards others. And that's, you know, as I said, that's, that's the parable of that, that second parable that I talked about, which I think the reason why it's less well known is because it's actually quite confronting, um, that idea that if you have been treated with extraordinary generosity, that um, you then almost have to put aside everything that operates in a world around us that's very different and treat others similarly, that's actually pretty confronting. And so that's, that's probably how I'd try and come back on that question. Thanks very much. I was just going to pop in with one further thought, sorry, um, which is that I think one of the dangers, though, here is, yes, I think greater, greater ability perhaps creates greater responsibility but it also doesn't work as a kind of get out of jail free card for the rest of us, right? There's a tendency to say, oh look, you know, Jeff Bezos could have paid for this, he could have sorted this all out. If only he paid taxes. Sure, agreed, but he doesn't. So then the question comes to the rest of us, okay, other people aren't stepping up. What do we have to do even though we've got much less resources than other people? So that's, I just want to, you know. Thank you to the both of you for your speeches. I have a question for both of you. So the way in which we treat others is very much linked to how we see the meaning of life. So to both of you, what do you think is the meaning of life? <laughs> you get to go first on this one. <laughs> okay, so if I just stall a bit, then my time will get used up and I won't have to try and answer the impossible question. Um, Thank you. Uh, look, th there's different ways of, of describing that. Maybe part of the background to the first of the parables that I talked about, so the Good Samaritan, um, might help explain at least a Christian response to that question. Um, it actually begins with uh, a, a person coming to Jesus asking that, that very question. You know, what, uh, the language is used, what must I do to be saved? But you know, how do I inherit eternal life? What is my purpose? What, what's it all about? Um, and Jesus says, pretty simply, he says, well, what do you reckon? And the person says, well, you know, in a theistic world that he lived in, he says, oh, I should probably love God and I should love my neighbour. And to which Jesus says, yeah, that's pretty good. And the man clearly recognises that that's a simple ethic, but it's hard to enact. So he says, well, who is my neighbour? To which the answer comes, well, there's a Samaritan and an injured person. So that's, that's the answer to that question. Um, I think... Partly what it's doing is it's setting us in a bigger context. The meaning of life as, as the way in which Jesus will describe it is it's recognising that we live in a world that is wonderful in every way but is not ours in the sense that we made it. 
uh, there is a God who's made it and therefore what he thinks about it is going to be the key to the answer. Uh, in the same way as which if you were to make something and you were to make it for a purpose, if someone comes along and sees that thing, to answer the question, what is that for, they'd need to ask the maker. And that's, that's probably how I think as a, as a chaplain and as a Christian, that's the beginning of the response that I'd give there. So, all right, David, let's hear from you in two minutes. <laughs> I mean, so this, is, this has been taken as a kind of central question in philosophy for a very long time, from very kind of positive answers to, to very bleak answers. I mean, Albert Camus says uh, the point of philosophy is to answer the, que the simple question, why should we not kill ourselves? Right? That's his, his kind of take on it is there must be something, what is it? Uh, and so on. Um, I, I mean, I guess my take on the question is... Uh, there's a concept in, in uh, Zen Buddhism, so there's an answer to questions, uh, which is mu. Uh, and so the answer, to, answer mu means uh, not yes, not no. Not not yes, not not no. Uh, it, it's basically a way of saying, I'm not sure the question is the right question to ask. So I'm not sure there is a meaning to life. I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced there is a kind of overarching thing that uh, craves us all a cause or, or some kind of purpose, in, in part because, and I think your answer displayed it really uh, clearly, that it presupposes a sort of purpose giver in a way that I think is hard to decide whether there is or isn't or, or things like that. I don't think that removes meaning, though. Right? So I think the meaning is then up to individuals to decide for themselves, uh, but there are still fundamental things. There's still a fundamental acknowledgement that these things are like me, and that makes them important in some kind of fundamental sense. So I don't think there needs to be an overarching account of importance or purpose to still recognize, you know, this, this is my brother in a fundamental sense. All right. Thank you. A question for David. So in your opening address, you spoke about the world being broken, citing observations of inequality, racism, and some other things as evidence. Uh, so I'd say calling the world broken implies that it previously has not been, perhaps in the future it won't, or at least it shouldn't be like this. Why do these observations lead you to say the world is broken as opposed to the world just being the world without the need for a label? Yeah, it's, that's a fair question. I, I found myself wondering exactly that this morning uh, because I was thinking, I was thinking, well, so when was it better? All right. Uh, uh, and the answer is, it's not really been that much better. It's often been a lot worse, right? So one way of reframing this is to think, actually, you know, yeah, there are things to work on, but we've already done a lot, and there's more to do, and that's fine. Sure. Um, so maybe I don't have a good answer for it. Partially, I was inspired by a book that I've read recently, uh, which is uh, Tim Morgan's An Ethics for a Broken World, uh, where he, he imagines a... So the book is basically him imagining an ethics course being taught three, four hundred years in the future for after the fall of civilization, uh, looking back on what they describe as the ethics of affluence. Right? And so how people make excuses for themselves, choose not to help others, uh, and so on. And so the, the, the lecture is effectively somebody explaining uh, how all of these different beliefs and this interest in what I can keep for me uh, led to where they got to at that point. So part of it is that. But yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I shouldn't describe it as broken. I should say it's a work in progress. It's a fixer upper. Thank you. I'm back, and my question is for both of you. Um, if moral value is linked to my own sense of value, what happens if I don't value myself anymore, for example, in the case of mental illness? Do I lose any moral obligation to my neighbour? You want to go, shall I? Thanks. <laughs> <sighs> OK, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, really tough. Um, Look, I think there might be places where, yes, you probably don't have moral obligations because uh, you've lost your way sufficiently that what you need to work on is you uh, rather than everybody else uh, or everything else. Um, so, so I think, yes, that can be the case. Uh, yeah, uh, but I, I don't... Hmm. I mean, I guess there's a difference between whether moral obligations have a kind of bind or whether they're present at all. Uh, so I suspect in that situation, they're definitely not binding. Are they still present? Mm, I'm not sure. Not sure. 
Thanks, David. Um, yeah, look, I, 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 I certainly want to acknowledge that really difficult situations that sometimes some of us find ourselves in, uh, I think that calls for just generally from all of us a compassion and a, uh, I guess, a width and a gratitude and a graciousness in our response. So whatever you might talk about in theory or at least uh, in general, we need to recognise that any kind of principle that you have needs to allow for exceptions and for really difficult situations. And I think this is exactly one of them. Um, maybe the question that I'd come back with would be, uh, where does individual worth come from? And had, like, that's the bit that, you know, to answer, come back to how David began his speech, that's the question that lies behind the question and the, the very first one, where does a sense of worth come from? And there's different, different ways to answer that. Um, again, in line with the, I guess, the worldview or the framework that I'm proposing, as a, which is a Christian one and a theistic one, that is, there's a belief in a God um, and a God who makes us, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, value comes, uh, or in, an individual's value is um, not internally generated or understood or perceived, it's actually uh, conveyed or it's attributed in this case, by a maker. Now, that's, that raises a whole series of questions. Um, what, is a, what is a maker like? Um, how effective is this maker? What happens when things don't work out? What do you do when a world is broken? You know, to come back to the previous question. Um, but that's probably the part that I think I'd, I'd like to respond with. Where do you, what is the source of self-worth and self-identity? And as I said, as, as a Christian, I'm trying to say that's something that is um, deemed or conveyed by another. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Cool, hello. Um, I'm just wondering a question firstly for Jeff. Um, from my Christian worldview, I tend to think of people in, in or neighbours in two categories, the, the, the lost or the unsaved or the, the children of God, those that we might see in our churches. Uh, how does this fact how does this affect sort of how we see them as our neighbours and how much we owe them? And then for David, do you, do you see this as a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, often Christians have talked about those who are in and those who are not. Um, sometimes they've done it in a judgmental way in, a, in an attempt to exclude, and clearly everything I said today, that doesn't fit within the way in which Jesus describes the world. Um, I, I think probably my, my reflection would be that... Um, at one level, uh, we're to see everyone around us as exactly the same. That is, as something that has, as someone who has been made wonderfully, um, who has great potential, and yet at the same time is desperately in need of love and acceptance. And that's that applies to all people. Um, a Christian worldview would say some people get that and some people don't. For those who get that, uh, the the principle of that second parable about that unmerciful servant is if you've understood just how treasured you are then that drives the way in which you treat others and what you want for other people so those are probably some of the things that i'd try and reflect on there um, it's probably less about seeing division and more uh, um, that acknowledgement that if we have been so blessed that's a blessing we'd long long for others to partake in and to share in as well so thanks david Tough act to follow. <laughs> um, yeah, I look, I, I guess I mostly just want to agree with Jeff here. I, I, I think that uh, having ins and outs or, or groups that we identify with and groups we don't identify with, that often leads to really bad things. Uh, it's a very easy, like a lot of the harms we do as people or as groups is by othering, as seeing as the other as an outsider, as, as the, the wrong people, the people who don't understand, who don't get it, uh, and favouring our own. So I, I guess I would say insofar as we look at things that way, and I think it's also natural to look at things that way, we think about people who are our people uh, and so on, it's, it's common language, uh, to think about the others as people who aren't there yet, but are still heading in the same general directions, maybe. Thank you. Cool. Um, thank you both for everything you presented. Um, my question is to both of you, um, and it is, what shall our 
approach be to progress? Um, and so both of you talked about this massive inequality um, between the rich and the poor. Um, and as a rich nation in Australia, do we wait for others to catch up before progressing more? Um, so, David, you talked about a couple of issues that we spend a lot of money here um, in Australia on. Um, are we supposed to wait um, for other people before we can progress? Um, like, is this something that we owe to our neighbour? Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry. That's a really helpful question. Um, look, there's, there's different ways to answer it. One is you could answer it politically and say, well, quite frankly, what's the point in us cutting um, carbon emissions if China and America don't, because it's not going to make a scrap of difference in the end uh, on a global scale. Um, I think most of us sense that that really in the end just feels like a somewhat selfish answer designed to enable us to avoid having to deal with hard issues. Um, I suspect that's how most of us feel. Um, I, my comment would be that, um, again, thinking of those two stories that I told, the story about the Good Samaritan is that here's someone who... I guess crosses the road to go and help an injured traveller, not really knowing where it's going to end, but recognising that at that moment it's still a good and right thing to do. Um, and that's probably a useful thing for us. We can't always see the end to our actions, but we can still take a step forward as we are. My one caveat to that, which is designed to be optimistic, uh, is a very bleak and pessimistic <laughs> um, rider, which is... I still think you want to ask the question, where could this end and what would be necessary to get to a good conclusion? Because if in the end you can't imagine a way in which there will be a good path forward, I think you do need to ask, is this a bit futile? So that's me kind of trying to have my cake and eat it too, is trying to say, don't just wash your hands and say, it's all too hard, let someone else take the leadership on this. But at the same time, you still need to ask, do I think we're actually going somewhere and will we get there? Because if you're not, I think you probably want to consider a different project or a different proposal. Yeah, thanks. David? Uh, so in Confucian moral philosophy, uh, there is a virtue that we don't, we don't have in Western moral philosophy, and I think it's something we missed, and it's a real shame we missed it. Uh, so there's a, there's a concept uh, called D, uh, which, is, which is broadly speaking like virtue is infectious. Uh, so the idea, so if you look at Confucian thought, the idea is you set up your state to put the most virtuous people in charge, not because it's the good people, but because that virtue will spread down through society, right? Uh, and I think there's something to that. Like, if you think about kind of cases where, I think we've all been in them, you see something going wrong, right? Maybe some people are having a fight, or, you know, you see somebody say something really inappropriate to somebody, and you're like, oh, should I step in? Should I do something? And if somebody else does it's much easier for you to then step up and go, okay, I'm gonna back them up, right? Uh, and so my take on all of this is, is, is basically that, right? So uh, we need somebody to step up before other people will step up. And if we all stand around and say, well, I'm waiting for everybody else to step up, nobody steps up. So we're better to be the person who steps up, even though that's scary uh, and socially costly um, and a bit worrying, like, worrying and so on. You're better to kind of overachieve and, and, and maybe others will let you down and that's a shame than to not be the people who step up. All right, thank you all for your questions. Um, I know there's a few people whose questions have not been answered yet. Um, I apologise for the time constraints. Um, but if you would like to um, come and chat to these guys um, afterwards, they'll be um, still here. So um, feel free to have a conversation. Um, all right, so that concludes our time together today. Um, thank you so much for your attention and your participation. Um, I hope it has been really interesting for you. Um, so I would like to um, thank our speakers, David and Jeff. So um, if you guys want to give them a round of applause.